Chapter 11 Espendor Remembered Varens dreamed. He was back in the trenches of Espendor, as he had been every time he had slept on his journey to Ajax on the wardship, and every night since. Espendor was always so real in these dreams that he thought he was there again. The ankle-deep, stagnant water stank just as bad as it had at the front. The sky was just as dark. The rising and falling drone of flies was just as monotonous. The fear was just as real. He and Bolus were on the reach line. The broken city of Connor's Reach was behind them, and miles of shattered trees were in front of them. Mist wrapped tight about them like a funeral shroud, trapping maggots to a corpse. Death was everywhere. This was the War of the Flies, the creeping doom offensive. The war had been going on for over a century. The campaign on Espendor was but one of many enemy actions plaguing Ultramar. To Varen's, it was the only one that mattered. Greasy rain belted them, not acid enough to burn the skin, but over time enough to degrade a uniform's fabric and cause boots to disintegrate. Feet exposed to the mud rotted. Compromised bioseals in their masks let in disease. The enemy had a myriad ways to kill a man. The rain was only one. The mist, laced with infection and chemical poison, was another. It was thin enough today that Varens and Bolus risked leaving their respirators and goggles up for a while. Intense claustrophobia afflicted many of the troops on the line. Varens twitched at a tickling sensation on his back. A moment later he felt it again, coming up over his shoulder and onto his neck, then brushing his ear. His skin crawled and he swatted at his head without thinking, mashing a fat fly against his helmet. With a grimace, he wiped the mess off onto his filthy uniform, adding pale, pussy smears to the crust covering his bio-gloves. Even in the damn rain, the flies don't let up, said Bolus. If there's one thing I hate about this war, it's the bloody flies. He added, waving more of them away from his face. Suppose that's why they call it the War of the Flies, he grinned. The warriors either side of Bolus and Varens had tight faces, white with fear. One of them attempted to smile. The rest of them remained glazed. Cheerful bunch, muttered Bolus. Go easy on them, acting sergeant, said Varens. Another fly buzzed too close to his face. He blew out at it, disrupting its drunken, lazy flight. I'll go easy on you before I go easy on them. They're in for a hard ride then, said Varens. I'd rather face the enemy than another scolding from you. Their exchange was inflated purposefully with bravado, but what they intended to be wry and sardonic came across as forced, and it had little effect on the morale of the new recruits. All other squad members were new. Casualties were high. Of Varen's last squad, only six were left, and they'd been split and incorporated into fresh units to stiffen the resolve of the fresh meat. Fresh meat goes off quicker in this war. That's what Bolas had said about them. They didn't make the rookies smile either. This had happened so many times, Varens was losing count. He didn't bother to repaint his unit markings anymore, not that they could be seen under the mud and filth of Espandor's battlefields anyway. He rotated his shoulder. The tickle turned with the hint of a sting. Another fly, probably, looking for weaknesses in his double-thickness uniform. The damn things were bloodsuckers, all of them. 
a civilized cardinal world with broad expanses of wilderness. Espandor had been a place of cool forests with human settlement restricted to the cities of the western continent and the lesser agri-complexes scattered across its warmer zones. The planet's woods and oceans had been left in near, pristine state. Or so the pre-mission edifications had depicted Espandor before Varens arrived, six interminable years ago now. He had only ever known it as a sea of mud, a moribund place plagued by the dead who came shambling from the wastelands of shattered trees every seven hours, regular as manufactoria shift changes. Several of the larger cities were gone, and trench lines surrounded the remaining three civitae. Their hinterlands were seas of mud, the patchwork of forests, and agricole leveled to provide fields of fire. The assaults of the dead were therefore severely hampered. The dead were slow, and the ultramar auxilious guns many. The enemy's diseases were rife, the population was a shadow of what it had been, and the planet had ceased to be a productive part of ultramar in any way. But if Espandor was sick, at least it was still alive. Still imperial, still ultramarian, still living. Fight for it with every breath in the Primarch's name, for that is the will of the Emperor, Varens whispered to himself. After that, he had no more time for prayer, for the seventh hour klaxon blared, and the enemy came lurching out of the mist. Here comes today's batch, shouted their lieutenant, his amplified voice distorted by the voxmitters attached to his comm operator's pack. Hold the line. Prepare to fire on my mark. Respirators on, men. Goggles down, said Bolus. He snapped his equipment into place over his mouth by way of example. His next words were muffled. Make sure the seal's tied on your bodysuit. Don't get their filth on you. Varens got down off the firing step to help a panicking young soldier who was failing to get his gear set right on his face. Your clip's twisted, that's all, said Varens. He tugged off one dirty glove, not with his teeth, never that, and adjusted the balaclava around the soldier's face, wiping rain from the trooper's face and untwisting his strapping. With goggles and respirator on, there should be no exposed skin, and so the Emperor protects, he said, setting the youth's mask in place, and then his own. Whisper your thanks to your battle gear, trooper. It will keep you alive. The young man nodded too hard. His eyes were wide with fear behind the yellow plastic of his combat goggles. Varens slapped his shoulder blade and moved on. The mortal warriors of Ultramar were better equipped than most Astra Militarum regiments. Without this equipment, they would lose half their number to sickness after every fight. Varens checked his part of the squad over, patting backs and steadying nerves. When he was satisfied, he climbed out of the sucking quagmire of the trench and took up position on the firing step again, lest resting his laze gun on the sodden wood of the parapet. The tickling sting in his back became an annoying itch, but he barely noticed it. The time had come to fight. Slowly, the enemy emerged from the fog through the driving rain. Their silhouettes were human, their gait anything but. A shambling, jerky walk that betrayed their nature from afar. The dead of Espander came to war. One of the recruits gasped, the humanity strangled out of his exhalation by his respirator. A sharp, lazy crack had Varen's turning. A shocked, boyish face looked back at him. Rain steamed off the muzzle of the recruit's lazy gun. Hold fire, Lieutenant Atanus's voice crackled over the fat squad fox. Bolus rested his hand on the body of the gun. His damp glove hissed as it brushed the barrel. Heat radiated off of the power pack. Wait, 
sun, you need to be precise. Shooting at this distance is a waste of charge. Rain and fog disperses the light. You don't want to be swapping out your ammo while those things are clawing at your face. Every shot saved is another to fire when you need it. Save it until the command comes. Aim for the heads. Always the heads, he added, looking meaningfully up and down the line. Those of the young soldiers who had grasp of their wits nodded and leaned into their gun stocks. A couple stared tearfully out, gazes fixed. The auxilia ordinarily had excellent training, but the needs of the war meant these recruits had been hurried through. They were conscripts, and they weren't ready. The shapes of the dead solidified. They had been civilians, mostly. Their torn and dirty clothes were whole enough to give hints as to their origins in the overrun cities further east. There were a few Astra Militarum uniforms among them. If a position fell, it wasn't always possible to behead and burn the bodies. We are fighting ourselves, a trooper said. Unease rippled down the line in a wave of nervous mo movement. Varens cursed the boy inwardly for speaking the truth. Quiet there, guns up, take aim. A soft tattoo of clicks and rattles undercut the drumming of the rain as his order was obeyed. Other sergeants and veterans gave their own commands, and the parapet grew a leafless hedge of lace barrels pointing into the blasted forest. There was no bombardment. Too many times the dead had clawed their way back up from the earth, taking the defenders by surprise, and shells for the big guns were running low. Espander was remote, always had been, right at the edge of Ultramar. Supply had become increasingly difficult as the plague fleets stepped up their activities. Even back in the days of the 500 worlds, it had been isolated, though when so many other worlds had been cut loose from Ultramar thousands of years ago, Espander had remained within the fold. The dead staggered onwards, slack expressions on their faces. They did not speak or make any sound, only the sucking of the mud at their feet and the drumming of the rain accompanied their march. Their flesh was rent, innards hanging from split stomachs, greening muscles exposed in ragged skin. There was no way an organism like that could function. All the men stationed on a spander knew the dead for being born of warp craft. The commissars ruthlessly dealt with any found speaking of such things, but they were facing unnatural monsters. Sorcery. It could not be denied. Varens let out a tense sigh. His breath was sour in his mask. From away down the line, one of the last regimental priests bellowed prayers into the silent advance. The dead turned away from that quadrant as if ordered. Varens wished there were more holy men. Cardinals Ruit ruled Espandor in the name of the Adeptus Ministorum, though it was subordinate to Macrag, and so there were many men who claimed to be holy in its cities. But the priests of the world rarely came to the front. They were busy beseeching the emperor to turn away the clouds of flies from the cities, they said, and tending to the many sick and overseeing the disposal of the dead before they could reawaken. They had their hands full. Varens thought them cowards. He had been terrified at the sight of plague zombies in the beginning, but Varens' fear lessened with each exposure. For all the horror of their being, the dead were clumsy. They were only dangerous in large numbers, and these assaults, though unpleasant, were easily dealt with. Once, a theater of war like Espander would have attracted the attention of the Ultramarines themselves. But there were worse things attacking their empire, and they were needed elsewhere. There were supposedly space marines on Espander somewhere. Varen 
Jones couldn't say if that were true. He had never seen them. The dead drew closer, lips smacking wordlessly together in a parody of living speech. Fire! roared Lieutenant Atenas. Ruby laze lights stabbed out from the trench. The air cracked. Rain hissed loudly into steam, generating rank, warm clouds that settled on the line and thickened the fog. Fire! ordered the lieutenant again. Multiple laze beams riddled the corpse walkers. The dead began their dance, jiggling as beams of coherent light blasted divots from their ruined bodies. But still they did not fall. Aim for the heads, shouted Bolas to the recruits. He snapped off a shot at a lurching shape, pierced already with half a dozen black holes. Though the flesh was cauterized, the wounds leaked black fluid. Bolas cursed as his shot tore off the thing's ear, and he adjusted his aim. Varens felled one behind Bolas's mark, trusting the acting sergeant to make his next shot count. He had a glimpse of a filthy officer's uniform on the dead man, a priceless power sword scabbarded at his side. Men, they are dead, but they will die anew. Hit them in the heads, shouted Ferens. Bolas's second shot was true, taking the approaching plague walker full in the face. Its head disintegrated, and it fell down, chest rattling as it died its second death. The fog darkened directly in front of their line. Scattered silhouettes became a shadowy mass. Damn it, there's a knot of them coming this way. Bolas picked up the vox horn from the vox operator's pack. This is Acting Sergeant Bolas, 4th Squad, 2nd Platoon, requesting fire support on my quadrant immediately. The veterans of the Espander War reacted quickly. A heavy boulder dug into a projecting bunker almost fifty meters away, swiveled and banged loudly. Compact, self-propelled munitions burned through the mist on streaks of flame, numerous enough to light up the trench in yellow firelight. The bolts cut the dead to pieces, burying themselves in their flesh and exploding, scattering gobbets of rancid corpse meat over Varen's unit. The men on the line let out a premature cheer, but the dead were not done with them. Several standing dead remained. A dozen more hauled their broken bodies across the mire with crippled limbs, ignorant of pain. Laze beams snapped out at them, but too many of the recruits fired wildly, and things that should have died in the mud of the kill zone reached the trench line. There, they simply toppled forwards, landing with bone-cracking force in the mud at the bottom of the trench, or fell onto hapless troopers. Those that didn't land upon a target flopped about, stiff arms and legs twisting as they struggled to right themselves, teeth snapping at the limbs of the living. Most of the recruits remembered the drill and moved out of the way, but not all. Quick, don't let them bite you. Kill them, ordered Varens. He drew his pistol and put a shot into the head of a foe struggling with a new recruit. One bite and you'll be like them. The heads, the heads, aim for the heads. A scream had him whirling around as another dead man fell directly onto a recruit. Teeth unnaturally white in the ruin of its face clashed at the soldier's neck. The plague zombie bore the young soldier down off the step. The creature was naked, but for a helmet still snugly strapped about its chin. Blurred regimental tattoos marked its upper arms. Varen's first shot was deflected by the helmet. The second corded through. The reanimated corpse died, head dripping molten blast steel and rotten brains. Varens was at the youth's side before the corpse had collapsed, dragging him from the muck and shaking the shock out of him. Are you all right? The soldier stared mutely back. 
Varens quickly checked the seals around his mouth and eyes and shoved him back against the wall. The last few dead were being permanently put down, and no more had reached the trench line. Out over the wasteland, others were falling, speared through the head by ruby light. The fresh soldiers seemed to have finally caught on. Varens, Bolas called him over. We didn't lose anyone, said Varens. Bolas shook his head grimly. It's not over yet. There's something new. Listen. Varens struggled to see anything through the swirl of rain and drifting steam. The fog had thickened through the fight and reduced visibility to a score of meters. A dirge came out from the murk. All is ash. All is ash. All is ash. The words were wet and thick, carried on breath from lungs full of fluid, up throats clogged with phlegm, uttered by swollen lips. All is ash. All is ash. All is ash. They droned. The words were laden with loss and sorrow and the inevitability of the end. They sent a chill down Varen's spine. Hysterical giggles and guffaws of mirth interrupted the chant, as if the chanters performed some sacred duty they could not take entirely seriously. That made it worse. The new recruits wavered. Behind the last few staggering dead stalked huge shapes, bloated giants of fearsome silhouette. The grinding of ancient motors sounded out their every step. Those spikes and unholy adornments had changed their shapes from their intended form. There was no mistaking what they were. Kill them and save us, said Bolas, his confidence shaken. Heretic Astartes. Behind his visor, his eyes shone with fear. Keep the lads in line, he whispered. These aren't going to fall as easily as the dead. Varen's stomach tightened. He nodded, teetering on the brink of utter panic, but his training took over, and he and Bolas went into action. All is ash. All is ash. All is ash, chanted the enemy. Stand firm, shouted Varens, retaking his position. He looked meaningfully at the soldiers to his right. They gripped their guns tighter. All down the line, other veterans shouted similar encouragements and threats, or cursed the new men for cowards, whatever it took to keep them from breaking. Screamed orders to halt came from close by, followed by the single bang of a bolt pistol. They all knew what that meant. The recruits stilled. The certainty of death for those who fled versus the probability of death for those who stood firm steadied them. Silence filled the trench as sure as water. All is ash. All is ash. All is ash. The drone persisted. A quiet voice gibbered in the mist, its owner lost to view. I don't like it, I, I don't like it, I don't like it. Bullis snatched up the vox horn. Lieutenant Atnes, please advise action regarding new foe, said Bullis. Lieutenant? He looked at Varens, not answering, damn him. One of their own squad sank down to his knees to pray his laze gun sliding from the saturated trench wall and landing in the slop at the bottom of the trench. Bolas was on him in an instant, dragging him up. Get back on your feet, he screamed at the young man's face. If you want to die on your knees, I'll shoot you myself and save the enemy the bother. A second later, heavy weapons opened up. This time there was no holding back. Shells rained down from artillery in the rear. Disgusting mud heaved skywards, pattering wetly down over the trench lines. Man-portable heavy weapons added their fury to the storm descending on the traitors. Through the blizzard of earth, metal, and fire, Varens saw Blake 
submarine bisected by a laser cannon blast. That one had the decency to die. The rest walked on as if the falling ordnance, the Medusa rockets, the heavy boulder shells, and the rest of the Imperium's martial rage was of no more concern to them than the rain. The barrage crept near to the lip of the trench, pelting the defenders with debris. A last, whistling descent, a final explosion, and the shelling ceased, leaving Faisaline smoke to whip into the greater body of the fog. The enemy was in range. Give fire, ordered Atnus over the Vox. Fire, yelled Bolas, his voice raw-edged with panic. A hundred laser guns blasted, their bright red light illuminating the mud and the visored faces lining the trench. It was a vision of some primitive netherworld, raw and bloody with punishment. Varens counted no more than twenty or so of the enemy giants, but their boldness in assaulting the position was justified. He watched as one was riddled with shots that would have blown apart any other target. The plague marine didn't even slow, but trudged onwards with his fellows as if nothing had happened, his armor smoking. All the while they chanted, All is ash! All is ash! The nearer the traitors came, the more awful details emerged. They were no longer fit to be called men. Adeptus Astartes once, they had sold themselves to fell powers, for reasons no rational mind could comprehend. Diseases of every kind afflicted them. Their stomachs were distended, straining the capacity of their swollen war gear to contain. Where exposed, their skin was inflamed or outright necrotic. Their innards dangled freely from corroded gaps in their armor. Mucus, urine, feces, blood, every humor of the body dripped from them, all of it stinking and tainted with the hues of illness. Parasites crawled over them, wriggling freely into and out of their never-healing wounds. Their droning spoke of great misery, but on helmetless faces, smiles shone. There was a joke they all knew, and they were eager to share it with the rest of the universe. Though the wind blew away from the trenches, and though the auxilia's respirators were manufactured to strain out all atmospheric pollutants, the stink of the foe was overpowering, a carnal smell of rot that made Varen's wrench into his mask. All is ash, all is ash. Nonchalantly almost, the traitors leveled their weapons. Rusting bolt guns and plasma guns whose cracked containment chambers sent out hissing jets of superheated steam pointed at the line of exposed heads at the lip of the trench. All is ash, all is ash. At once, they opened fire. The guns banged as they ejected their munitions. A second louder bang sounded as the bolt shell's jets ignited and accelerated them well past the sound barrier. The final noise, the one that had the bolt gun rightly feared as a weapon, was a flat banging as the rounds slammed into soil and flesh and there detonated with deadly force. Varen's visor spattered with gore as the head of the youthful soldier at his side was obliterated. He'd been with the unit two days. There had not been time to learn his name. Keep firing, keep firing, he shouted over and over until he was hoarse, but the blare and clatter of battle was so great that he could not hear his own voice. Then, the flies came, despite the rain and the gunfire, and everything collapsed into confusion. They buzzed in swarms, so thick that they turned the air solid. Varens lost sight of the man nearest him. For a long second he saw nothing. Then 
the swarm was away and over him, and Varens looked death in the face. The traitors had made their way to within meters of the trench. Directly opposite him, a giant in armor stained the violent turquoise of ocean-corroded iron, turned his weapon upon Varens. He thought that he would surely die. Then the emplacements at either end of their section opened up, raking the traitors with fire. He watched in amazement as the Plague Marine's obese frame absorbed four heavy bolt rounds, the explosions of their detonations in his massive body sending squirts of ichor out of the holes in his armor. The traitor shook, but did not fall. He only succumbed to the impact of the fifth, and keeled over like a rotten tree into the quagmire. A new wave of flies battered against Varen's helmet, hard as death whirled hail, obscuring his vision with swirling curtains of pale, furry bodies. Then they were gone once more, and the traitors were at the trench. Three heretic Astartes attacked Varen's section, tossing wizened heads before them that exploded like grenades. A choking gas filled the trench, and several men fell to the poisons within the smoke as it ate through their respirators. All is ash, all is ash, the traitors sang. The plague marine nearest Varens stepped onto the edge of the earthwork. Dozens of laser beams found him. His corroded armor turned the light aside, or else the beams were absorbed by his monstrously bloated body. Pulsing, rotting organs hung through the gaps in the ancient ceramite. Oil dribbled from the armor's ailing systems, and the reactor unit on his back hitched and coughed with the maladies of machines. The wooden and plastisteel facing of the trench gave way under the traitor's immense weight, and he rode the collapsing wall down, bringing a wave of sloppy mud and broken flesh with him. He rose over Varen's. Half his helmet had corroded away, exposing rotten teeth and a single yellowed eye. The remains of the helm looked like it had melted somehow into the warrior's flesh, becoming one with it, but incompletely so. The bottom still moved as a separate artifact, whereas the top, rippled green skin melted with the metal into a semi-living mass dotted with separating boils. The gray horn sprouted sideways from the warrior's temple, the cracked mess at its root bleeding yellow plasma. Behind the giant, others of its kind fought with stolid efficiency, bludgeoning their way through the dozens of mortals who opposed them. There was shouting, and much weapons fire, and the crack of disruption fields as auxilia officers brought their power weapons to bear. But Varen saw only a little of it past the steaming, diseased bulk of the plague marine bearing down upon him. The visible portion of the heretic Astarte's face was bloated and pallid, the face of a man close to death, but a fevered mirth lit up his eye. Scabbed lips quivered with an avuncular chortle. He held up a clubbed hand whose little finger was a limp tentacle. A greening nail pointed directly at Varen's. You first, he said. The Blake Marine raised a boulder flaking with rust. Such a thing should not have functioned, but the servants of chaos were not bound by natural law. The heretic roared with laughter as the guns slammed out bolt rounds. Varens threw himself aside as men were cut down all around him. Mass reactive shells pierced flesh and detonated, tearing men into red scraps that were quickly lost to the mud. I said you first. Mumbling annoyance, 
the plague marine stomped forwards, crushing the ribcage of a wounded auxiliary. Red-tinged water filled his boot prints. The thing was monstrous, a blasphemy against mankind and his proper place in the universe, and it was unstoppable. Laze beams pattered off its armored hide. Expanses of exposed leathery skin hissed as they burned. The Blake Marine acted as if nothing were amiss. Father Nurgle waits for you in his garden, little man, he said as he racked a final bolt into his gun and leveled it at Varen's. Be glad you go to a better place than this. When your joy has subsided at the sight of your new home, be sure to tell him Atricus of the Death Guard's fifth sept sent you. From nowhere, Bolus appeared, ducking in under the plague marine's arm. The traitor moved to react, but its only weakness, or so it seemed, was that it was as slow as the dead it shepherded. Bolus was not. With a move that would have impressed the commandos of the Militarum Dembestus, he jammed his gun up and under the heretic Astarte's helm. The creature growled as the weapon forced the helm's metal away from the conjoined flesh. So you can be hurt, said Bolus. Good. He pulled the trigger as the traitor wrapped its disease hand around his throat. devised by the high sciences of the Emperor to withstand great damage, and made more resilient yet by the magics of chaos, the plague marines of Nurgle were nigh immune to harm, but they were not unkillable. Even they suffered from a point-blank laser gun shot to the face. The traitor's head cracked open with a wet squelch, Curls of atomized flesh rose from its helmet. In the ruins of its throat came a last bubbling breath, and then it toppled forwards, knocking Bolas back into the mud and landing squarely on top of him. Bolas was buried by his dead foe. Only his arm protruded from under the traitor's cracked breastplate. Varens threw himself forwards and dug into the mud, Bolus's hand twitched and scrabbled. Hang on, Bolus, hang on, my friend. As fast as Varens dug at the mud, trying to hollow out a space so that he could drag Bolus free, it filled up with dirty water. Vile fluids from the dead heretic Astartes seeped into the mess. Bolus was drowning in that filth. In desperation, Varens hooked his hands under the shoulder plates of the dead traitor and heaved. Corroded ceramite flaked to pieces in his grasp, though the blade shifted on its worn joints. He could not move the bloated space marine. A wet, tearing pain stabbed beneath his shoulder. He did not remember being hit, but that did not matter. He could not exert his full strength. It wouldn't be enough if he could. He might as well have pushed at a spander and tried to move it as shift the dead traitor. It seemed a long, desperate time, but perhaps only seconds passed. Hands shoved him away, making space for others to join him. The new recruits were there, those that had survived. Two of them jammed blast steel beams taken from the trench facing under the traitor's armor. Heave, they shouted, using the beams as levers. Heave. The beams slipped in the filth. Bolus's movements were lessening. The respirator had limited rebreathing capacity. He had only moments left. Dig deeper, shouted Varens, scrambling up and grabbing a beam. Fine, solid ground to push against. He helped shove the plasteel down until it would go no further. Then he leapt for the top, hung off it, and leaned backwards, ignoring the hot pain in his back. Heave, shouted the young soldiers. Teeth gritted. They shifted the giant's shoulders enough to expose Bolus. 
Two of the youths have pulled the acting sergeant out the instant before the beam slipped, and the traitor fell back into the mud. Varens grabbed Polis's face. Polis, he shouted. He scraped mud off of his friend's visor. Polis stared back at him with wide eyes. He was silent, but alive. The rain hammered down on a sudden quiet. The traitors were gone. Whether dead or vanished, Varens could not see. He had no time for relief. He suddenly felt very cold. A slow pulsing in his back reminded him of his wound. Bolas stared up at him, his expression empty. When this had happened back on Espander, Bolas had been unarmed in body, but something had gone in his mind. They had been through triage and taken away from the front line on medical transports back to Connor's reach. At the spaceport began the endless rounds of processing that had resulted in their evacuation to Ajax. That was then. Now, nightmare departed from memory. A carrion movement within Bolus's flesh had Varen's recoil in horror, but his hands would not obey him, and he could not release his friend. Forty-nine, forty-nine, Bolus giggled, his mask filled with writhing maggots that burst from his shriveling eyes, but he laughed on and on, all his ash. Varens awoke screaming into the silence of the Medicaid ward. Feeble hands shook him. Varens screamed again and lashed out. Ouch. The hands were removed. Shut up, Varens. We're trying to get some sleep. Groused Mukai, the man who had the cot next to his. He stood over Varens, looking grumpy. Consciousness came, displacing sleep just as rushing water sweeps away sand. The horror remained. Varens clamped his mouth shut to stifle the last of his screams. I'm sorry, nightmares, Varens managed to say. Mutters from the beds nearby spoke of a lack of sympathy. Varens reached for his water, hands shaking. The battle had been just like he had dreamt it and he dreamed it every night. The aftershocks of his nightmare receded, leaving him shaking. He fumbled for the water by his cot. His hands, shaking, knocked the plastic cup onto the floor. For the sake of the Emperor, keep it down. Hamidson, the man on the other side, shouted into his pillow. Sorry, Varen said. He was awake now. He needed a drink, so he slipped out from under the thin blanket and picked up his cup. His back twinged, but it was a good, healing pain. Rubbing at his wound, he padded between the long rows of beds. The ward was a wide hall, with eight rows of low cots. The men here were all injured in ways serious enough to warrant their evacuation but not likely to be invalided, invalided. Nearly all of them would be sent back to the war, unlike the men on some of the other wards. There were halls in the hospital for whose occupants a hard life of poverty awaited, doing whatever work their disfigurements allowed. The richest could afford augmentics. The very brave might be patched up and sent back to the front as morale-boosting examples. The rest would do what they could. For Ultramar, for the Imperium, for the grace of the Emperor, he whispered under his breath. He made the sign of the Aquila obsessively over his chest. The lights in the small rest area calmed him down. Varens poured himself a cup of water that tasted of disinfectants. He drained it, pulling a face at the aftertaste as he took the cup from his lips. It was better than the water on a spander, though, and in plentiful supply. He had another cup, then started towards bed, but a superstitious unease halted his steps, and before he knew it, he was turning around and heading towards the ward where Bolus was. 
medic A in low-ranking gray was in the chair outside Polis's ward, head bowed over a devotional pamphlet. He wore a small lamp over one eye that lit, lit the cheap paper a livid yellow, each splinter of wood pulp a strong detail against the blue blur of night. The hands holding it were just as blotted and blunted by hard work. What do you want? The medicae looked up, the lamp shining into Varen's face. Varen's held up his hand to shield his eyes. I came to see my friend, Polis. He's in here. Patient 900018-43A. He waved at the scratched glass partition. A large 16 was stenciled onto it. What do you think you are doing? No visitors, said the orderly. He looked back at his pamphlet. Please, said Varens. It's not for him so much as for me. I... I have these nightmares. If I could see he's all right, then I'll sleep better. If I sleep better, then I'll get out of here quicker and be back to the fight. The orderly sighed and set his pamphlet aside and looked up and down the corridor. He was the only man on duty. Unoccupied chairs sat outside the other wards. All right, just this once. No one's looking. But if I see you around here again, I'm reporting you. Do you understand? Varens nodded gratefully. Yes, yes, thank you. The orderly took a heavy ring of keys from his belt and unlocked the door. Checking they were unobserved again, he held it wide and ushered Varens in. One minute, any disturbance, I'll see you shot. The halls for the psych cases were much smaller than those where the physically injured rested. During the day... They were bedlams, but at night, merciful drugs brought a dreamless sleep. Machines pumped soporifics into arms chained to the sides of sturdy beds. Varens came to Bolus in eerie silence. Varens looked down. In sleep, Bolus wore a scowl that made him look like the hard man he had been. He was peaceful. Varens let out a sigh of relief. On the way back to the door, he heard Bolas speaking. He should not have been able to, not with the drugs, but he was. Forty-nine, he mumbled. Forty-nine.